Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A few things I wanted to finish up before I take your questions. Number one, the meaning of Sharia. Sharia means path. The path of life, that way of life that is lived in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is called Sharia. So the way this is explained in Arabic is that words have lexical meanings, dictionary definitions, lafz imana, mana. And then sometimes there's a particular way that word is used in our deen. So the dictionary meaning of sharia means path or way, like you call shara fesl, yuhamakullah. And in our deen, sharia means that way of life that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fiqh in Arabic simply means to understand. Tafakku means deep understanding. Faqih, like alim. Faqih means a person of deep understanding. Fiqh in deen means to understand how to live that way of life that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in more simple terms, that understanding is do's and don'ts. What to do, what not to do. This is how they describe, define fiqh. Ma laha wa ma alayha. What will be for the benefit of a person on the day of judgment and what will count against him. Usul is the plural of asl. Asl means root, foundation, basis. So usul al-fiqh means the foundations of understanding, the roots of understanding, the principles of understanding. So usul al-fiqh is what? The principles of, and bases and foundations and methods of understanding that way of life that is pleasing to Allah Ta'ala from the textual sources of the Qur'an and Sunnah. Alright? Okay. Now... Inshallah, it's sufficient. Oh yes, so one question, the questions I was getting the past few days which I reserved for today. Question, but I hope the questioner wasn't actually asking this question, but they were probably presenting to me a question that people pose of them. The question is that Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam himself was not a Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, or Hanbali, therefore why should I be one? So I'll give you several ways to answer this question. Number one, although most people may not know or talk about it, there are seven different canonical styles of reciting the Qur'an. Me and you and most people in India, Pakistan, recite in hafs, qiraat hafs For example, there's another qiraat way of recitation called the warsh that the people in Morocco recite. If when you go to Makkah, Makkah, Madinah, Manor, you see that larger format copy of Qur'an, that's warsh. For example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Adameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Maliki Yomid Din That's Hafs Malik Maliki Yomid Din That's Warsh Malik Malik Different styles of recitation Every single believer today necessarily will recite according to one of those styles These two are more prevalent and now the people pretty much only know the other five are the ones who are specialists in Kirat They're called Saba Ashtar Qari they actually spend many, many years mastering these different styles of recitation. All right? Qari, don't think, what you think is Qari is husni a beautiful recitation. That's something else. To adorn the recitation with the beauty, stop, beautiful style. That's something else. I'm talking about the proper discipline of the different recited, different canonical recitations of Quran. So if I ask the question, that why do you recite like this with the Prophet of Hafsi? Now, we don't say that about ourselves that we're hafsi, but in reality, in your recitation, you're a hafsi. All right. Sayyidina Rasulullah was not a Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, or Hanbali. That is correct. He was neither a Ashri, or Maturidi, or Athari, or Hanbali, nor was he a Salafi, or a Dilbandi, or even strictly speaking, he also never used the word Sunni. <laughs> right? So, by that definition, you're going to be in trouble in a lot of things. Right? The reality is that Sayyidina Rasulullah was the teacher. And he did things in multiple ways. Now, the, the scholarly tradition understands it like this, that the scholarly tradition views that this mul- there's a mercy in this multiplicity. There's a mercy in this multiplicity. So I'll give you an example, that if every single thing, and I did this for you previously, that some people, it's their inherent, not inherent, but it's their programmed instinct, that there must be a single monolithic code that is called the sunnah. And that's it. Why? Because the sunnah is from the Prophet of the deen of Islam. So there's one deen of Islam? Yes. There's one Quran? Yes. 
There's one Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes. So why are there multiple ways of doing things? There should be one way of praying. That's it. <laughs> right? There should be one answer to this question. Pray now or pray later. There should be one. So I'd say no. Many did emerge from this one. The tradition viewed this as this is the wish of Allah Ta'ala. This is Allah Ta'ala's hidayah. Allah Ta'ala made the deen like this. Allah Ta'ala is the one who made Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do this different ways. In fact, they view, our tradition, we view that the madhahib collectively preserve every act of the Prophet Sallallahu that spiritual approach. Because Sayyidina Rasulullah was the most beloved to Allah Ta'ala because Allah Ta'ala loves the Prophet every way the Prophet held his hands. Allah Ta'ala wants people in the Ummah to keep holding their hands like that because they're the actions of his beloved. Because his beloved Sayyidina Rasulullah had different ways sometimes of doing things himself. Allah Ta'ala wants that multiplicity to continue in the Ummah. Now the way the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah handled this multiplicity was called plurality, pluralism which means mutual respect and mutual coexistence and acknowledging the other as valid. The way the Salafi school handles the multiplicity is no plurality, there must be singularity. One thing must be defined as the sunnah and the others must be going against the sunnah. So what does it mean? So if you pray in a way different to what they think, they will actually say to you, it's not one or two of them, the overwhelming majority of them say it over and over again, that you're praying against the sunnah. Right? So what does it really mean? There's different ways of praying. Selecting those positions of prayer in which there are multiple authentic hadith evidences according to the usul of Abu Hanifa or the usul of Shafi. That's the real choice. There's no question like this, this is a choice that I either pray according to the Sunnah or pray according to Maliki Fiqh. I pray according to the Sunnah or pray according to Hanafi Fiqh. All Sunnah is found in Fiqh. <laughs> There is no sunnah outside of fiqh. Fiqh is the understanding of the sunnah. But you will have to have some prism, some interface to that sunnah. You cannot plug in direct. You can't plug in directly on those places on the map. Remember? Those places where there's one text and one meaning, or multiple texts and one meaning, or multiple texts and multiple meanings, but you know which one came later, you can plug in directly to the sunnah. But those places in the chart, which is one text, multiple meanings, multiple text, multiple meanings, or doesn't even exist in the sources, you cannot plug in directly. All right? Is it possible for an alim of our time to be inclined towards Imam Manifa for some things and Imam Shafranta for other things? It depends on the level of that alim. If the alim reaches the level of tafakkur, and there are some ulama like that alive today, you will find this in them, that there will be like 1% of issues where they, let's say like there's a Hanafi alim who's reached the level of tafakku, there will be one, okay. so they will reach the level of tafakku, they will then, I know Hanafi ulama like this, who I also agree that they've reached the level of tafakku, and they will occasionally not agree with the Hanafi position on something. But that's an occasional matter, right? I wouldn't, call them hybrids because a hybrid means 50-50%. I've never met any alim with tafakku like that. In fact, I can issue the challenge. In history, there's never been a 50-50 one. When you reach the, the part of reaching tafakku deeply is being trained in an usul. It's not possible. If somebody says, okay, I want to pick. Okay, there's another question. How do I pick? You will pick what you were born into. Yes. People are disturbed by this, but why? <laughs> You mean if I was born in Saudi, I would be a Hanbali, and I was born in Indonesia, I would be a Shafi, and I was born in Nigeria, I'd be Maliki? Yes, that's what I mean. Because all four are valid. It's not where you're born, it's which is most accessible to you. For example, if any one of you say, I want to practice Maliki Fiqh, well, number one, there's not that many, there's, there's a little bit, but there's not complete Maliki Fiqh in English. And there's almost none in Urdu. And you don't know Arabic, so you don't have access to that scholarly tradition. Number two, there are no real Maliki. There's a couple, there's a Tunisian Maliki teaching at Malta Jamil Sal's mother's son festival. But he's more into the bleak in any case, right? He's not a faqih in trying to understand Pakistani society according to Maliki Usul. So you need ulama who understand your society, who understand your culture. So it's about access. It's about depth of knowledge, right? Yes, if a person lives in a place like America, where there's basically they're equal, there's not equal number, but there's a fair number of ulama. So I have met one of my, well, I can't say good friend because I met him a couple of times, one of my acquaintances, but who I am very fond of, 
uh, so I'm happy to take his name and I'm some of his, I don't know, Sheikh Hamza Wal Makbul. He's an Indian Desi Deobandi Maliki. <laughs> because he grew up in America and actually when he came towards Dean, he came towards Dean through certain instructors in California who were not from a Hanafi background, who were from a Maliki background. So because he learned his Dean from them, those were the teachers, so he's Maliki. Now when he came here to study in Pakistan, and he came here because he still felt that the taqwa and sunnah of the ulama here is unparalleled anywhere in the Arab world. So he still came here to study hadith. He said, I want to take hadith from these muhaddithin because they follow the sunnah the most in their lives. It doesn't make a difference to me that they're Hanafi and Maliki. This is the true spirit, right? You don't look, you pick your teachers on the basis of ilm and taqwa when you're looking at hadith and tafsir. Obviously for fiqh, if you're Hanafi, you're going to need a Hanafi fiqh teacher, right? So there were some people here who used to tell him that, oh, you should become Hanafi, and what's the matter with you, and you're Indian, and Pakistan, you're, Pakistan, you're Desi, you're Pakistani. He said, no, no, but that's not the right approach. He found this in California, all right? But it's about, but why? The same thing was because of access. You see, the answer again was access. When he came towards Dean, what did he have access to? He had those scholars who were near him in California. So the real answer is about access and accessibility, all right? Ease of learning. Okay, what's the difference between a faqih, mujtahid, and mufti? All right. Highest level is in, in terms of these three. Although sometimes, definitely, some people may use these terms interchangeably. Actually, the real is that it's, the, it's better to understand the activity, the role, the function. Because obviously, every mujtahid is also a faqih and a mufti by definition. So, ijtihad is the highest. Tafaqqu is second. And ifta is actually third. Ifta is third. Most of ifta is naql. You see, other than a Supreme Court judge, most judges are simply ruling according to constitution, case law, precedent. It's the Supreme Court justice who can engage in constitutional interpretation, right? So the Supreme Court judge is like a mujtahid, right? And a faqih is like a high court judge. And a mufti is like a sessions court judge. All right? Okay, that's just one, I mean, that's not strictly parallel. That's explanation by way of analogy. But there's not complete, it's an analogy, right? It's not a complete likeness, all right? So, second, the mujtahid is the one who derives, okay, I'll give you levels of activity. First level, to be able to derive usul from the Quran and Sunnah. Second level, to be able to derive new rulings from existing usul. Third level, I can't derive new rulings either, to simply transmit and relate existing rulings that were derived an existing usul from the Quran and Sunnah. Three levels. To be able to derive usul, the ability to derive rulings, and third, the ability to derive neither, but to be able to transmit them faithfully. That also requires a lot of knowledge. You see, not every doctor is going to research medicine. Every doctor is not a researcher in medicine. He's a knuckle. He's like a mufti. He's just a knuckle. He has his handbooks of medicine and his training, and he's been told that this illness give this antibiotic, that illness give that. He's doing knuckle. All right? So these are three levels of activity. Ijtihad will never end, but the scope for Ijtihad is on new matters. You don't need to do a new Ijtihad on how many Rakat Zohar is, or whether to do Rafi al or not, because the Ijtihad is completed on that. These were finite, discrete tasks. They don't have to last 1400 years. Is there any other religion that has as deep an academic material like Hadith and Fiqh and the Deen of Islam? The answer is no. Because in Hadith, there is no other religion which claims to know that much about his Prophet. If you ask the Christians, and we have the sayings of the Prophet, so can you give me the sayings of Jesus this much? They say, no, we can't give you at that level. We say, we know how the Prophet used to walk. We know how his smile was. We know how he used to dress. Can you tell us about that Sayyidina Islam? They won't be able to tell you at that level. All right, Fiqh. Uh, actually, the closest thing to Fiqh is actually Jewish rabbinical law. It's called Halakha in Hebrew. And... That's close, but it's still nowhere near. Uh, it's actually not close, but it's the, I wouldn't say close, it's the closest thing that resembles uh, a concept of fiqh, all right? But you wouldn't find that. Uh, okay, no. All right. Uh, how do you become a mujtahid today? And if somebody claims to be a mujtahid, as an Islam, how can we check his validity by WhatsApp? No, oh, the, the, the question came by WhatsApp. <laughs> I, uh, check his validity by WhatsApp. Allahu Akbar. I got it. The question came by WhatsApp. Allahu Akbar. All right. I have to understand that ijtihad is a word that people use incorrectly. So real ijtihad, capital I ijtihad, 
means to be able to derive principles from Quran and Sunnah. Small i istihad is to derive rulings from those principles. Then there's a way people have hijacked, the modernists have hijacked the word istihad. For example, there are people in Canada who talk like this, that we need to make an istihad that hijab no longer exists in Islam. We need to make a istihad that homosexuality should be allowed in Islam. This is not istihad. All I say to these people, look, don't hijack our word. This is a word that is used in the scholarly tradition of Islamic jurisprudence for a particular specialist skill and activity. You should say some other word that we are progressives, reformists, enlightened, moderates, whatever you want. Make a call for reform. Don't hijack our word to give yourself some legitimacy. All right? So you may have come across the question or may have come across that use of the word istihad. And that's incorrect. That's not the proper use of this word. Right? Okay? If husband and wife both belong to different madhabs, how will the matters of divorce be settled between them? Does the, does the wife have to follow her husband's madhab in everything? Okay, I will add to this question because you will also have cases of litigation, property disputes, civil law, criminal law between two parties. One is Hazrat Hanafi, the other one says I'm Shafi. So the best way this was handled is in the Ottoman Empire. Because in the Ottoman Empire, which was not just current Turkey, there was a whole empire, right? In the Ottoman Empire, what they did was they actually set up courts for each fiqh. All right? Then what happened was that if there were two litigants, each belonging to a different fiqh, then that would go to a central court, and that central court would decide the matter, trying to take into account to the extent possible both of the fiqhs. All right? Now, I don't know to what extent. It really depends what issue the husband and wife want to do. But generally speaking, yes, generally. Now, I don't want this. St the statement should not be misused for any abusive relationship or unjust relationship. But generally speaking, the wife is tabe to her husband. Wife is tabe to her husband. All right? Okay? And it is sometimes a bit easier in collective matters to simply make a decision that in our collective family decisions we will follow one set of usul. But in your personal affairs, like the Let's say the wife is Hanafi, the husband is Shafi. Well, that's personal individual amal. So they can keep praying according to and, do, and doing any other such individual acts. But if there's something collective, it will make it simpler. But like I said, it's possible to try to do it multiple, but you'll find lesser scholars who will have that ability to skill to guide you in that. That was Ottoman Empire, deep, robust intellectual civilization, institutions of learning, courts, judges, chambers who knew these things. Today, you'd like, I wouldn't be able to do that for you. If you wrote to me and said, I'm Maliki and my husband's Hanafi and did this divorce happen and tried to use both fiqh, I would say openly my training in Maliki fiqh is not sufficient to do that for you. I would refer you to Sheikh Hams. I, I can refer you to the him. Mashallah, he's actually well trained in both, right? Okay. There is a statement that says, choose taqwa over fatwa. All right, actually, this is a separate thing, all right? Now, this is now spiritual approach, right, if we bring that in. So, fatwa will tell you what is permissible and impermissible. Strictly speaking, fatwa is not to tell you what's preferred. Fatwa is to tell you what's permissible. But many times, spiritually, in terms of trying to build a stronger relationship with Allah Ta'ala, you should be trying to hold yourself to a higher standard. So, one example I give of this is smoking. So strictly speaking, the fatwa on smoking. If you smoke occasionally, smoking is what we call makruh tanzihi. If you smoke regularly, smoking is makruh tahrimi. And if you're what they call a chain smoker, pack smoker, such that the doctor tells you that this smoking is not potentially hazardous, not pot it is harming your health, or your body is in amana, now smoking is haram. Now smoking is haram for you. All right. But the spiritual approach is that, okay, well, I smoke occasionally. I'm not, <laughs> alhamdulillah. But a person was to say about themselves that they smoke occasionally. So they shouldn't content themselves with this. That is makruh and zihi. They should try to hold themselves to a higher standard of behavior. They shouldn't just look at the fatwa, right? That it's not outright haram. So a higher standard of behavior is what? Lakad kana lakum fi rasulullah It's a question, could you ever imagine Sayyidina Rasulullah sallam? taking a single puff, and if you're horrified by that concept and offended by me even suggesting it, and I hope your iman finds it to suggest an offensive. So why don't you find it offensive yourself? And that's actually a better way for makru. Makru means offensive. Makru means you are doing something offensive to Allah Ta'ala. 
but he's not going to punish you because it's not haram, but you're offending him. Like sometimes a person might offend me, I won't scold them, but it doesn't mean they didn't offend me, right? They did offend me, but I won't do anything about it. That's a better translation from Makrazi, but just like it's offensive. Now why would you want to do something that's offensive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? So that's why some people say it like this. Could we give some more information, deeper information, why we shouldn't mix? We'd like to be stronger on that point. What concerns arguments against it? How to explain? Okay, that these are two separate questions. All right. I gave you quite a few reasons why I remember I was going to fight it. You end up using your akal, you end up using your nafs, akal instead of ilm, nafs instead of kalb, right? How about this other way of mixing? So there was a alim, great faqih, was also a great sheikh of the sawa, falama abdu wahab sharani Sheikh Abdul Hashanani Mutala, he wrote a work in Arabic called the Mizan al Kubra. And that's a brilliant work. Uh, and I had heard about it, and my heart was full of joy when I finally read it in 2010. I finally was able to read it. Uh, he actually takes legal positions and puts them on al Mizan, on a scale. And he orders them according to which one is the most ihtiyat, which one is the most careful, precocious. And he says, You should do amal on that. <laughs> but it wasn't his. Madhab, it was just a suggestion. Later on, there was another great alam, Alama Shatib, who critiqued him for that and said, look, you're making things too difficult for people. It means pick the more precautionary position on everything, right? But at least that spirit, there's kuchesi look bizindo, right? Huh? There should at least be that strand who is trying to do, so that strand is captured in this, follow taqwa versus fatwa. Right? So as I was telling you that this is another way this is a way that people have mix and match. So if you meet somebody who's so insistent on mixing and matching, give them Sheikh uh, Asharani's al mizan al and Say, okay, fine. This is one way I've agreed you can mix and match. Do that. After this, no, I'll go back to one mother. i go back to one mother. Right? I'm thinking how many more reasons can I give you? Right? Uh, You know, another reason is that it's not easy to pick and choose and mix and match, right? Because what what standards are you going to set for yourself? I'll always pick from all four, or I'll just find out any two and pick one of the two. I'll find out three and pick one of the three, right? To what extent will you determine that you've, quote unquote, known all four, if you say I'm going to know all four? On what basis, what criteria would you select? So the practicalities of that are quite difficult. Most people who do it, like I told you, they do it either pure arbitrary, like that fellow who prayed that night, Tarawih, on the basis of their akal or on the basis of their nafs. And all three I've given as many arguments as I can think of against these three approaches. All right? Oh, yeah, morning question. Is the person we marry predestined? Yes. But you also choose to marry them of your own free will. Yeah. <laughs> all right? What about divorce? Okay. Yes, in theory, yes. In theory, divorce is also predestined, and in practice, people choose to divorce each other. Maybe that's a good way to phrase it for you, right? In theory, who you marry is predestined, and in reality, you will choose who you marry. In practice, right? When you keep doing good and choosing the right path, will Allah Ta'ala keep you from doing wrong? And if you keep doing wrong, will that result in a sealed heart? Here, actually, there's two levels of the sealing of the heart. One is Allah Ta'ala sealing the heart against Iman because the person kept refusing to let the Iman enter their heart, right? One is for the believer, if they keep sinning, yes, sometimes Allah Ta'ala doesn't seal the heart in this place, rather Allah Ta'ala lets a veil come on that heart, which means then that person can become desensitized to their sin. So if they keep sinning, keep sinning, keep sinning, Keep sinning means keep sinning without repenting, keep sinning without repenting. Then yes, Allah Ta'ala may take away their his asas, nadama, their remorse for that sin. Alright? Is it true that dua changes the dear? Yes. One Sahabi asked Nabiya Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what are the two things, that, is there anything that can change my takdeer? The Prophet said, yes, dua and amal as salih praying to Allah Ta'ala in righteous action. But of course the person would say, well that's also in their takdeer. That they were going to make that dua to Allah Ta'ala. That was also known to Allah Ta'ala. Yes, obviously it was. That they were going to do that extra amal salah to change the takdeer. Was that known to Allah Ta'ala? Of course it was. So that's why I told you we take it out of the predestination. Islamic 
kalam, put it in this force of knowledge. Everything is in the knowledge of Allah Ta'ala, even any dua you would make. What's the usul al-fiqh of other imams? Yeah, there's usul al-fiqh in all four, but Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal didn't really have much usul. Now when all the other three madhaib had produced lots of work in usul, there was a Hanbali scholar, now the name is just skipping from my mind, he compiled a work on Hanbali usul, I can't remember, and he basically tried on his own to try to retroactively identify some type of usul methodology in the rulings of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Rimulatullah. Okay, this answer I explained is a question from the morning that if every person does have the freedom to believe, but of them, the person who converted is because they just happened to be surfing and read or saw something on Islam. So the other person didn't see that information on Islam. So then when the convert he says, I converted because I heard this, but that means that others didn't convert because they didn't hear it. So is that really fair? Like I told you, right, the ability to hear, the ability to inquire is there. And second, a person, I already explained to you at the very end, if you remember, the salvific exclusiveness, the fancy term, that what's going to happen to the people who didn't know Islam, right? So I told you that's a very complicated discussion in theology. All you need to know is why don't they know Islam and what you can do to get them to know it, rather than for you to worry about if no one in the ummah makes them know it, what happens to them after they die, you don't have to worry about that issue, right? That's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, Allah ta'ala will know what they knew and what they didn't know and what they were responsible for, that's not our job. And Islam doesn't necessarily teach us that. Islam teaches us this much, that the committed unbeliever, the one who knew and disbelieved, that's the one we're supposed to say is going to Jannah. And we have to have that aqidah. We can't have that, I know it sounds soft, people think, no, I think Allah Ta'ala will forgive them also. It's a nice thing to say, apparently. But it's not nice because you're taking Allah Ta'ala's right from He's Allah Ta'ala. He has said, Allah said that. To who are you to say otherwise? All right? That indeed those who disbelieve and idol worshippers, they will be in the fire of hellfire, fire of hell forever. They will dwell therein forever. So we can't say. But those are the ones who are definitively identifiable as people who chose not to believe. Right? There's the choice element that's there. And without knowing, yes, there's a question. There's really a choice. They don't even know about it. So I said, well, we don't know about that. The Quran tells us about those who chose to disbelieve. And the Quran tells us about those who chose to believe. And those who you're saying don't have a choice, we don't even know. Because some theologians argue to show you that not everybody has a choice. Some theologians also to that position. No, everybody has a choice. Why? Because they said it's the attribute of Allah Ta'ala's hidayah is al-hadi. So they actually argue that for Allah Ta'ala to be, have the sifat of adl and hidayah, to be just and to be the guide, for his guidance to be just, everyone must have it. So like what you said, to be fair. So then that theological group says, now everybody has gotten a hidayah. You may not see it. They may not be able to accept it. But they all got it. So everybody has made the choice. Every person who reaches adulthood will get at least one blast of hidayah from Allah Ta'ala that is sufficient to enable them to make the choice to believe. That's one position. But you won't be able to quantify that or see that empirically. But that's also a position people had. Alright? So there are lots of positions on that. In the time of the Khulafai Rashidun, that precedes the Madhahib. Right? Because the Madhahib start in the time of the Tabin and Tabai Tabin. It's not around in Sahaba. What is there, what I'm telling you, is in Quran and Sahih Hadith and Khulafai Rashidun is the non-jurist following the jurist. The principle is there. So we won't say the word madhab strictly that the people of Basra followed the madhab of Hassan. But the concept is there. The people of Basra followed the juristic scholarship of Hassan. Ta'ala. The Sahaba of Yemen followed the juristic scholarship of Sayyidina Muhammad ibn Jabal. So that concept is there without necessarily calling it the word madhab, right? Theory of evolution is too long for me to do in a Q&A. It's also one of the many, many topics that were not covered in this course and inshallah will be uh, answered in future courses or other courses inshallah. <laughs> Intellectual property rights are also off topic. Is Imam Ibn Taymiyyah Rumatala part of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Okay, now this is a bit of a specialist question. 
you know, for me to answer, I'm going to answer the person who asked this question, because anybody who asked me this question knows certain things. Some of you may not be able to follow this answer. No problem. That's you know, all learning. All right. As far as I'm concerned, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rimullah Ta'ala, and Ibn Al-Qayyim al Jawziya, Rimullah Ta'ala, are 110,000% part of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. I view that they, they, they have had certain departures from the rest of the tradition. I view the, that as their, the way we call it artists, is tafarrudat, their outlying opinions. I don't depart them from the tradition due to their departures from the tradition. All right? Okay, so there are some hardcore, there are certain hardcore Sunnis, and I I'm totally don't agree with that, who will say they're not Sunni. They're Salafi. Salafi as a non-Sunni, as an outside Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now the reason is this, because the questioners also mentioned that, that basically the basis of Aqeedah, I told you that our belief that Allah is outside of time and space, He transcends time and space. La makana lahu wa la zamana lahu. Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziya in particular, even more so than Ibn Taymiyyah, no, they believe that Allah Ta'ala has speciality. Right? So this questioner is asking, does that single belief put them outside Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? My view is that no. That belief is outside Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but I won't gonna put, put that person outside Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Okay? Alright? The questioner would have understood. Inshallah. And to be fair, uh, on this issue, there have been few other scholars who have joined them on the particular issues that is called Sifat al that Allah Subhanahu wa is in some spatially, directionally, way high and above, right? I think that this is a very important way that we can use science to understand our deen. You see, when people lived in a time in history when they thought the earth was flat, and they thought everything was above, right? And this is about Christians, because Christians are even before Muslims. They also thought the angels were in the heavens. They thought the clouds were the heavens. When they said the angels live in the heavens, they thought the clouds were the heavens, right? Now, because we live in a scientific age, if any of you have been on a long-distance flight, it goes above the clouds, and you don't see angels. <laughs> it's not like they're unseen, and you're disturbing their realm. You will understand, because above the clouds, there's so many levels of the atmosphere, and then beyond the atmosphere, there is outer space and the solar system. And so we have, due to science, a much deeper understanding of the above and beyond. But people who lived in a time when the scientific understanding was just that the earth is flat and the sky and that's it, right? So for them to perhaps take a spatial understanding of Allah Ta'ala in a 2D world, because the world is flat, it's possible to understand. Maybe that's why they did that. Maybe we can just relegate it to that. Right? All right? I mean, that's just my personal, but I'm, that's a purely personal thing. Questioner starts, it sounds stupid, but this has always bugged me. SubhanAllah. Oi. Why did Allah Ta'ala create human beings in the first place? All right. Okay. Why would he make, create humans... If some just had to be, okay, just to have a creation forever. Well, you know, there are different ways to ask this question, right? It could also be happy, right? A person can be happy. Well, why did you give me this in the first place, right? Uh, the important thing is that actually, Allah does ghani, ghani is istighna. So it's important point, Allah Ta'ala has no need for us whatsoever. Allah Ta'ala has no need for us whatsoever. It means that if all the human beings from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last human being spent their entire life in disbelief and disobedience, it would not decrease and diminish the sha'an and majesty of Allah Ta'ala one iota. And if all the human beings from Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam until the end of time spent their entire lives at the highest level of belief and obedience, it doesn't increase the sha'an of Allah Ta'ala one iota. He's al-mustaghni al-ghani. So it's not because he needed us. It's because he wanted us. Now, if that's called love. So if somebody tells you, I have no need for you whatsoever, but I want you. 
to you feel even more touched you see this is not matlabi gharzi love this there's, there's no they have no need for me whatsoever they're just loving me because they want to do you what your reaction shouldn't be skepticism your reaction should be what i call you should get the warm fuzzies you know warm fuzzies in pakistan huh warm fuzzies means the hair rises up on the back of your neck and you get a cool nice tingly feeling all right there is warm fuzzies in our deen, but how to get that, we will teach you tomorrow, inshallah. Ah, yeah. What is the concept of time for Allah Ta'ala? There is no time. There is no concept of time for Allah Subhanahu La zaman Allah There is no concept of time for Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. But yes, sometimes he expresses this. What does it mean when he says, I was and this and that? Uh, by the way, this statement, Kuntu kanzan makhfiya wa uhbibtu an a'raf, that Hadith it could see that I was a hidden treasure. I wanted to be known. This hadith is actually from that second to last category. It means some muhaddithin view it as maldu, fabricated, and some view it as extremely zayf. So it's actually better not to narrate this statement as a hadith. The reason why many of the mashayikh and sufiyah and awliya used to narrate this was as a reality. That because they understood that yes, this was the reason Allah Ta'ala created humanity out of love not out of need out of love and not out of need and when you love someone and they're your beloved so you want to gift them with something and if you want to gift them with the greatest thing that's what you want to give them the greatest thing that you could if you really love someone if you really love someone you want to give them the best that you could give it might not be much you might be a poor person but you like to give the best that you could give so the greatest lover is Allah Ta'ala. So when Allah Ta'ala truly loved humanity, He wanted to give them a gift, which was the greatest gift. And what was that? He gave them the ability to know and love Him. This is His gift. This is the greatest thing He gave us. That He gave us the ability for us to know and love Him. This is the proof of Allah Ta'ala's love for us. Now because this sentence captures this reality, so many people would narrate this, but strictly speaking, that spiritual approach. Now, if you go back to intellectual approach, it's not actually correct to say it's a hadith. It means that the Prophet said it, but you can say it's a statement. Like, for example, if he told you a wise person said. Now, maybe there's a 1% chance that wise person was actually Sayyidina Rasulullah himself, right? So I won't take it off because not all hadith scholars agreed that it's fabricated. Some felt it was fabricated, some felt it was very weak, right? So it's kind of like dangling on the workshop by thread, <laughs> right? We've got some <laughs> danglers, right? It doesn't, we didn't cut it off totally, right? Okay, all right. So that's the answer to your question. So learn to love that being who out of his love for you enabled you to love him. That's why you were created. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah If you know someone who has iman and is very adamant on their opinion that the right way is to pick and choose and mix and match, how do you convey the message to them? You don't. You just share with them what you know and if they don't listen, no problem. Let them pick and choose and mix and match. It's their responsibility. Your duty is only to share with them the scholarly traditions of warnings and counsels as to why you shouldn't do that, if after hearing that they choose not to listen, so be it, no problem. No problem. No problem. Because like, it's not strictly haram. It can lead to haram. The act of picking and choosing itself isn't haram, but it might lead to something that's haram. Right? So at least try to make them careful of that. Okay, I already answered this question. How to answer those people who keep asking for this reference? Tell them there's a whole workshop. Our deen is not a deen of footnotes. Alhamdulillah. Our deen is not a deen that can be reduced to the single one-line footnote. All right? And another way you can deal with them is give them some hadith. For example, give them the, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you tomorrow if you want. You bring it tomorrow. The hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, where Imam Bukhari, I'm saying, Nari said the Prophet did, said the, Rafid in between two sadhus. Give them that. Say, so here's a reference. So say, why do you want a reference from me? Because they will say, well, because you can only do amal and you must do amal on what's in Sayyidi. Say, so, okay, here I'm going to give you some references from Sayyidi. Do amal on it. <laughs> First, you do amal on this and then you ask me. 
all right? Okay, that could be one way to do it, all right? How to explain fiqh to a person who has just become a Muslim? Don't, don't try to do this course. <laughs> don't, uh, yeah, everybody, again, Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallam said what? Kallam in nas bi qadri him. Talk to people at their level. The new Muslim, you just have to, you don't talk to them about intellectual or historical or even taking the word spiritual. The new Muslim, you just keep talking about Allah Ta'ala and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, basics of prayer, basics of akhlaq, they need to learn to make wudu, they need to learn Quranic literacy. There's so much to do. Don't get into these issues. Now still embedded in this question, but I have to teach them how to pray. That's one of the first and foremost things. Yes. So which mother do I choose to teach them? If they've taken you as their teacher, you teach them according to what you know best and whatever tradition you have access to, to be able to guide them properly. If you're connected to Shafi ulama and you practice Shafi fiqh, teach them Shafi fiqh. No problem. If you're connected to Hanifi ulama and you practice Hanifi fiqh, teach them the prophetic method, the sunnah way of praying according to the usul of Imam Hanifa. All right? That's all it is. The problem is that what happens is sometimes the new Muslim is very quickly captured by these other groups. I'll give you a literal example that happened in front of my own eyes in a masjid in New York. So there was a man, a young man, he came and he had been coming for a few sessions and he decided to accept Islam. So it was after one of the five prayers in Mashallah and then the Imam and there were some ulama mashaykh who were visiting also at that time. And so he accepted Islam. All right. And then so the imam told him, this was at night, Isha, and said that, okay, you know, what you do is, you know, mashallah, you go home and you do ghusl, and you come in the morning and we'll start teaching you some basic aspects of prayer. Because he had also come and he'd been observing the prayer because he was visiting the masjid. So he came the next day sometime in the afternoon, and he was carrying a book with him. And he said that, you know, I've come because I want to learn, and I brought the textbook. So the imam was like, you brought, what do you mean you brought the textbook? And he said, you know that when I left the masjid, one of the brothers who prays here, he pulled me aside. And he said, you know, all you need to learn Islam is this textbook. It was the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. And so I was so happy and he gave me this textbook. So I brought it and, I, and I'm ready to learn, <laughs> right? Um, now this person, because he's been confused by someone, right? Now it would be a, a dilemma. What am, I, what am I supposed to teach this person? How am I supposed to handle this situation, Right? So yeah, I mean, definitely there are certain situations which people create that can be problematic and confusing. All right. Okay, if Allah Ta'ala's attribute of Al-Hadi is infinite and eternal, then why would he seal somebody somebody's heart? Because Allah Ta'ala has explained this, Yahdi man yasha wa yudhillu man yasha. He has infinite mercy and infinite guidance, but he gives it to whom he wills, whom he wishes. Right? Now those words would have no meaning if he willed and wished to give it to everyone. Alright? So there's some who reach a stage in their life. So again, now you, you add, you combine these different aspects of the different workshops of theology. So Allah Ta'ala does give hidayah, core hidayah, basic hidayah to everyone. Then there will be some who Allah Ta'ala gives even more chances at hidayah. That's whom he wishes. That might be based on that behavior. Because, for example, I can tell you Every convert I've ever met was also basically a good person. It wasn't somebody who was abusing his wife and stealing and, you know, I mean, they may have had a past and then they reformed and became a good person and they came to Islam, right? So that might be it also. There might be some terrible person because he's a murderer and a rapist. Maybe that might be what well, doesn't give him hidayah. And there may be a very nice non-Muslim Allah that gives him hidayah. We don't know. We can, we, we, I'm just doing it for the sake, but indulging you. But strictly speaking, we shouldn't even speculate on this. Why does Allah Ta'ala give hidayah? He's, Allah Ta'ala is his sole domain. He alone is Al-Hadi. It's his sole domain and his sole decision. I don't know who asked this question, but the question was that you said that the reward and punishment on the Day of Judgment and Akhirah will be eternal because the person's intention was forever. But what about that man who lowers his gaze because he knows that he only has to control himself for a short time in dunya before enjoying the much better fruits of his toil in Jannah. <laughs> I, I, the answer, you, mean you should know the answer to that question yourself. Yes, if you stay away from sins in this world, 
that Allah Ta'ala will reward you in Jannah. But there's a higher reason, right? That's not a labor of love. That's a labor for wages. That's the labor who is doing the labor for wages. The higher level is the laborer who does what is called the labor of love, that they do it, yes, because obviously they don't want Allah to punish them, and yes, because they're hopeful of Allah Ta'ala's rewards and bounties in Jannah, but also because they don't want to be offensive to Allah Ta'ala, they want to be beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's the real, quote-unquote, fruit of Jannah, that a person will be beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Sometimes you become so intellectual that you lose your spiritual side, so the cure for this is some, you need some moments and activities in your life where you become so spiritual you lose your intellectual side. That's coming tomorrow, don't worry. That's coming tomorrow. That's where you get the balance. There have to be certain activities, engagements, moments of your life where you become so spiritual you lose the intellectual side. And then as you go deeper in deen, these two are actually meant to have complete convergence. There is no discrepancy between them. Uh, we have understood that in the realms of tafsir and hadith, the early scholars have detailed works that cover everything. So in light of that, what is the role of an Islamic school in today's world, apart from topical presentations as explained earlier? Well, you see, there's always new ways of explaining. So there's every century in this ummah, there have been scholars who have written tafsir. That doesn't mean they're necessarily writing something new. But there's a new way of presentation, a new delivery, a new way of, we call it intibak, of correlating that tafsir with halat hazara with the current situation, current society, contemporary situation, right? Uh, or to express it in the language of the people, which keeps changing every generation or so. So there is a need to have a living tradition. There's no claim from Islamic scholarship that it's all a dead tradition, it's all done. No, no, no. There are always new issues that come up and there may even be reasons to revisit old issues. Like I told you, I gave you one example, but I'm not end here because it's on a star, but I don't want to, I don't want to open this up for you. But like I said, science, our new scientific understanding of this universe and our place in it is just a dot on the planet, on the solar system, on the Milky Way galaxy, and the galaxy cluster in the universe, may make us have a more robust understanding of certain things in Quran. It doesn't mean we're taking our deen from science. That understanding was there in Quran. Right? But we couldn't fully appreciate it because we didn't know enough. Right? Alright? So there's always a need, if you ask me, to have continued living tradition of scholarship and commentary and interaction and discussion as well as authentic transmission of past scholarship and study of past masters. Jazakumullah khairas wa 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 jazakumullah khairas wa